Welcome to Luxoft Tech Talks, a series of podcasts in which IT gurus share their knowledge and discuss the latest trends and innovations in the world of IT. We are going to cover the most recent developments in the programming languages, frameworks, and technologies that are shaping the future of the software industry. This new format of online learning is part of Luxoft Learning Management and Development Services rebranding. Please share your feedback in the comments to let us know what speakers and topics you would like us to cover in later installments. Hello friends and welcome on today's final talk about advanced design patterns in test automation. We are going to cover desktop, RESTful API and data warehouse testing. I'm Evgeny Kostadinov, a QA architect with around a decade of experience when it comes to testing and automation. Let's briefly talk about what we have covered already in the series. We started with design patterns and different concepts when it comes to test automation. We looked at the entire ecosystem, which involves process patterns and the way how we can improve the overall testing when it comes to automation and the process. We have looked also in management and how we should better manage our automation efforts. Then we moved to design patterns and looked at the ways how we can make more efficient our solutions and how we can make them more extendable and scalable. Finally, we moved to the execution patterns, which really helps us to support a more reliable way of executing and delivering our tests. We also talked and covered different types of test automation frameworks. We have discussed how they build on top of each other and how every next generation of test automation framework really makes the best out of the concepts that are already being used and make known. Then we move to X-Unit test patterns. As we already know, they embody a lot of philosophy around them and, then, and they help us with reusable testing solutions. So we can see our concepts and design into the different patterns that are being put together in X-Unit. They very heavily stress on the need of defining a design for testing because without the all preconditions, it's going to be very hard for us to cover and really efficiently test the software. We moved into different setup and tear down patterns. The greatest value, as we discussed so far from our tests, is really when they're executed on a continuous integration server or a pipeline. We know that continuous integration is not just our server, but it's a set of practices different patterns and it's really really important to understand that we should always consider when we create our tests how they are going to be executed into this pipeline finally we've talked about good practices about how our test code is really production code and we should take the best care of it we should follow and even implement unit tests for our core logic we have looked into different principles like don't repeat yourself. Who is responsible and advises not to have a duplicated code or logic into our solution? We have looked into the solid principles. Next in the series, we have stopped and discussed how to make our design patterns a bit better and how to implement the proper solutions based on our context. We have looked also in the mobile testing considerations what challenges do we have, like the heavy environment setup, different devices, and the very huge OS fragmentation. We also discussed that another big challenge here is the parallel execution of our tests. We discussed that page object model is not the only pattern out there, and there are solutions beyond that pattern. We also talked about how serious limitations of page objects can hinder our design. Also, it involves us into a heavy taxonomy and we should always be aware that this introduces more complex refactoring. So when we're doing refactoring, it's all about structure. We should think of our design also when we are refactoring and do we hinder the current state. We talked about advanced design patterns like object map, loadable component, screenplay pattern, and mission pattern. We have looked how each of them slowly introduces better concepts 
better handling or separation of concerns. Then finally, we talked about good practices like hermetic tests. And here the concept is really about making our tests self-sufficient, meaning that they have to set up all the preconditions they need and not rely on chained state or global state. We talked about fluent invocation and how can this improve our ever growing in complexity solution. Finally, we discussed backdoor manipulation and how we can actually combine different X unit patterns with the backdoor manipulation when it comes to setting up or tear down our environment. Today, we are going to talk about advanced design patterns when it comes to desktop, API and data warehouses. We're going to first discuss what are the challenges when it comes to desktop testing and what we need to be aware of. Then moving into RESTful API backends and finally closing with design patterns that are applicable for data warehouses. Let's first start with the desktop testing considerations. First challenge, as you may remember from the previous talk, is really like the mobile one the heavy environment and infrastructure setup, since we need just a single instance in most cases to run here, it's always necessary to think about how we can make this practical. We need to understand that this instance should be first installed, then configured, and after that we can start with the tests. We should be also considering how we're going to get this package that we need to install into our continuous integration server. Executing tests in parallel again is quite tricky because like I said just a moment ago, we are going to have to work with a single instance of our application. Design patterns will, have, will help us to leverage the common code when it comes to reusing our so solution. In my experience, I have a desktop application which was communicating as part of the journey with a web browser because the only available and supported browser was Internet Explorer. So that's how we needed to combine the same code base for one journey to communicate with both desktop application and the browser. We need to always consider how to make the best out of this situation. The CI servers when they execute desktop applications are known to <laughs> to go asleep, which means that we should find a way to keep alive the session. So wherever our tests run, we don't get errors that the desktop is locked. Most simple way of achieving this is going to, for example, implement a Visual Basic script who is going to move the mouse or perform case strokes in order to keep alive the session. If we have, for example, a Jenkins slave, he's going to turn off the display after a certain amount of time. We need to make sure that our slave is always available and is going to execute our tests. There are, there are of course many different automation tools that are based on coordinates or image recognition, but we need to be, but we need to be aware that those tend to be flaky and more after than not cause more trouble than they help us. So keep in mind that tools like SQLy will require fixed screen size or image size because they work with the different, let's say, colors based on your monitor and the desktop environment, the virtual desktop environment that's going to be executing your tests on the Jenkins slave. So another consideration here is also that due to the image recognition, it's not possible to have a parallel execution. Let's move to a screen object. We have already discussed page objects, but when it comes to the desktop, we know that there's no pages. So we, we are going to talk about screens today. As design patterns, we know are general reusable solutions. They're very greatly applied if we consider always the context. Sometimes maybe we're going to just the part of them or just going to implement our way and adopt some parts of the pattern there's no strict convention who is going to enforce to follow the exact pattern if it's not applicable into our context. So today page objects or screen objects 
can be combined when we're going to test our desktop application with Python library, which is called PyWinAuto, standing for Python Windows Automation. Why we can afford and it's acceptable to work with page objects here? Pretty much because the selectors, their resolution, and the elements, the screen elements, are all bundled together in a single place, meaning that we don't have wrong by design solution, which we're going to keep separating object map from our actions that needs to be invoked on top of those elements. We have it everything tied up together and it's never going to change. Let's take a look at a quick Python example. Like I said a moment before, this is a Python automation library. So we're going to have a couple examples in Python. Let's look at the notepad automation script who is going to be kept in our screens directory. First and very important stuff that we need to understand here is how our backend works, how the controls, the Windows controls are going to be evaluated and how they're going to be communicated with. So we need to have two options here and we need to define which one is available and applicable in our context. For example, for backend with working with Notepad, we are going to work with UAI, but there's another option for the older versions of the Windows applications and it's known as Windows 32. So after we have identified and selected UAI, we can move to the actual test script. As we can see, the real encapsulation happens here because elements and actions are bundled together. What our test is going to perform here is going to open the Notepad application, select a save us from the file menu, then wait until this is existing, enabled, visible, and ready to be interacted with. Moving down, we're going to select the combo box, which is available as a drop down menu. We're going to select the encoding and then going to paste our text, which we want to save. Finally, we're going to click on the save button. Let's take a closer look at our selectors, elements, and actions. As you can see, everything is tied together. We are not going to have a hard coded selectors here, and the actions are pretty much following how we selected our elements, how we are finding them, and everything is tied and grouped together. That's why we can afford to work with screen objects. Pretty much overcoming all the disadvantages that the page object is introducing when you're working with web pages. Next, let's move to API testing and how we can approach this domain, how we need to structure our tests and what are the good practices when it comes to testing APIs. When we talk APIs today, we are going to think about REST APIs backend. So we're going to focus on how we send requests to this API, how we receive responses, and finally, how we verify the system's behavior. Maybe you remember from the previous talk that we have discussed the triple A pattern, which is pretty much standing for arrange, act, and assert. In basic terms, we're going to cover this today as well. As it backends, it mainly concentrates the business logic and most of our domain is going to be tightly coupled to the concrete business operating flows, how the modules are interacting or holding the structure of the domain itself. It's very important that when we are talking about backend, we need to have a deeper understanding of the technical stack, how our technology really works beyond, beyond the scenes, meaning that after our front end processes something, we need to understand what happens after that, how those requests are communicating with our backend, where we're going to have to look for answers if something goes wrong. Let's take a look at a very standard testing approach when it comes to testing backends. We have to perform the following points we can use as our guideline to create our tests. First and first most, we need to go and understand what's the functionality, the technology stack of our API program, and we need to clearly define 
what's in our scope. Of course, we need to think again what's outside of our scope and set proper expectations, discuss with the business what we need to cover and what is going to be our test coverage here. We need to apply also the appropriate testing techniques such as boundary value analysis, equivalence classes and error guessing when it comes to designing and implementing our backend tests. It's going to take more than that. There's really different testing techniques that we can employ, but again, we need to be practical. For example, we can use decision tables, which can help us with collapsing many test cases, which have pretty much the same output, but we should be aware that we should not go and oversimplify things. We need to cover different flows regarding of all the parameters passed, meaning that even if we have two tests, which seems that exercise one in the same flow, it could be turned out that they're invoking different paths in the code. So we should always be aware of this fact. We can use also straight state transitions, which are based on flow diagrams. And if we have a state machine as our backend, it's very useful to have such a diagram who is going, which is going to support our test case design. Then we can move to the next step, which is take a look and design the input parameters for the needs of our tests. It's very important here to understand that we should not always look just for the values, but also needs to, we need to take in mind and validate the response schema or the structure of our response. Finally, we are going to move to the test execution and compare the actual with the expected result. Let's not forget here that the reporting mechanic also needs to be taken in consideration here, meaning that since we have so many tests, because those are cheaper than the web tests, most likely we are going to have most of them, more of them. And this means that we need to perform analysis based on all the data that we have gathered so far and provide a digested business understandable report to our stakeholders. Moving to domain specific language. Domain specific languages like we can see from Wikipedia are computer languages specialized into a particular application domain. But what does this really mean? That they're created specifically to solve problems for our domain, meaning that it's very hard, not impossible, but very hard to migrate our tests from one company to another or from banking domain to uh, automotive domain just because, like we said, they solve problems specifically to this business, how the business works, operates with different integrations, and we need to always be aware of those limitations when we create our domain-specific language or layer, depending from the abstraction in our testware. So we should always try to keep those as simple as possible, but not simpler, and sometimes they can just be an object that interacts with the system under test, or as we can implement it, we can always augment the structure and make it work in our case. Domain specific languages are really tightly to get, uh, tied together with a domain driven design, which help us to connect the code with the ever evolving and getting more complex business model. So again, context is king here, and we need to always consider how this is applicable to our own needs. So we can use a domain specific layer to set up the data in the database, seed our users that are needed or in memory versions of the database or to help us create mocks or interact with the system by executing or wrapping the commands that we need to execute in order to test and exercise the system. And finally, they can do assertions of the state of the system that we need, making it, making it a bit more meaningful. Let's take a quick example in C Sharp. We're going to talk and take an example which is going to be related to a wallet. If we're going to work with a payment provider on in the banking domain, we're going to most likely have such an object. So moving in this object into our domain specific layer will help us to decouple all the specifics in the domain from the tests. Currently, what we have here is a basic function method that is going to withdraw money 
if we go to our ATM, meaning that our ATM tests should have dependencies like ATM service and account service. But all we need to pass here really to the withdraw method is the account number, our PIN and the amount we want to be withdrawn. So what we're going to invoke here are actually two services. First one is about authorization and making sure that we are the right person and we are going to pass the account number and the PIN to this service. Once this action is done, we can of course go and invoke the service, the ATM service, which is going to delegate this withdrawal method based on the past account number and amount number. As you can see, there's nothing about the test logic here, it's just the domain and the specifics when it comes to wallet. Another pattern very useful when it comes to communication with requests and responses is the command pattern. It's a behavioral design pattern which an, in which an object is used to encapsulate all the information when it comes to performing an action or a trigger an event at a later point in time. We are going to see that we can have a client which can decide at which point in time it should execute a specific command. We're going to encapsulate a request as our object and thereby we're going to allow our clients to pass different arguments, different parameters with different requests, creating a queue or walk requests and actually support undoable operations even if we don't have a transaction implemented in our backend. Depending on the programming language, we are going to have to move to servant, pat to servant pattern which we're going to pass an object implementing the interface, which is going to declare the signature of the past method. So keep in mind that most of these patterns are language agnostic, but depending on the programming language specifics, we either go with command pattern or servant pattern. Let's take a look at the main actors in the command pattern. The first one is the command object who knows about the receiver and invokes the methods of this receiver. Next, the receiver and the parameter values for its methods are stored in the command itself. An invoker object knows how to execute a command and optionally can do for us some bookkeeping for tests reasons or for some other advanced patterns like attack proxy, but we're going to talk about this a bit later. So it knows about the command execution. Invoker and receiver are held by the client as well with the command. So client knows and dictates which receiver it should assign a command to and which commands to assign to the invoker. The client decides which commands to execute at which point in time based on our needs. Let's make this a bit more visual. So like we said in the beginning, we have a client which knows about the receiver and knows how to invoke the methods of this receiver. Then we have an invoker who knows about the command and how to execute the concrete commands. Our client holds references to the invoker object, command and receiver. And at the end, it can decide which to execute and which points in time to invoke these commands. Let's take a look at another pattern called strategy pattern. This is very useful when we need more than one implementation of the same workflow do it, done and performed differently at the runtime. So depending on the context, we can choose the concrete algorithm based on the test needs and we don't need to recompile or do something else. This is always going to be executed at runtime. As we can see, the most basic implementation is really simple. We have a user who turns to abstraction of the implementation that needs based on the needs and the past parameters, for example, we can select one of those two implementations. Let's take a Python example, how this, is, how this could be implemented in the most simple way. As we can see here, we're going to discuss a registration strategy, which is placed in our domain specific directory, domain specific layer directory. So register strategy could have different implementations. We can register our users via web. We can register our users via a RESTful API. 
or we can see the database based on the, our needs. So moving into the concrete examples, we're going to see that based on our configuration or the past parameters, we can invoke different strategies and this can be done at real time, runtime. As we can see, this is a very good place to consider some of the X-unit fixture patterns. For example, when it comes to registration via web, we can go with delegated setup and this could be our default action. But if we want to have different tests and individual tests register users via the API, we can go with inline setup. And finally, if we want to have a batch of registered users, we can have a pre-built or switch setup and we can see the database with those users, pretty much executing the registration via data database strategy. Finally, as we can see in Python, since functions are first class citizens, we can just pass the concrete function to the register strategy and invoke the execute method. As we can see at the end, it's going to print different results. But of course, there should, there should be a much more complex logic here, not just those print statements. Let's take a look at another pattern. It's called proxy design pattern. And it, in its most general form, it's functioning as an interface to something else. This something else could be anything like network connection, large objects in memory, or some other resource that's expensive or impossible to duplicate. Or we want, for example, to do some bookkeeping when we're performing the operations over this object. It's very useful if you want to have control over this additional resource. And in the most popular method of using in the tests is to set up the HTTP proxy. It allows us dynamically to enable and disable blacklists, enable or disable stubs, excluding third party services like integrations with Facebook or Google in our tests. Let's make this a bit more visual. Today we are going to have an example about file service and a file server. We're going to put a proxy who is going to stand beyond those, between those two and whatever the file service makes a request for a file, it's going to call actually our proxy, which is going to get an ID of the file. When we have such a request, the proxy will first go and look in our cache if we have this object already or not. In our case, we're not going to have it, so it's going to wait for 50 milliseconds, meaning that this is done mostly for optimization reasons. If we have a very narrow uh, but heavy traffic, this can help us with minimizing and optimizing our performance. Whenever we have a second request, again, the same operation is going to be performed, is going to look for the cache, for the file in the cache and wait another 50 seconds, 50 milliseconds. If we have no more requests coming up, it's going to request in a batch to the file server, both files by their ID, IDs. When we get the results, we are going to return those to the file service. In the meantime, we are going to put the requested files in our cache. So next time the file service requests the same, let's say, file with ID2, we are going to check into the cache, see that we have this file and return the cached file. Let's take a look at a JavaScript example. In this case, a media caching proxy. Network fetch by design doesn't support caching. It will download resources every time it's been invoked. So what we need to do here is to provide our own mechanic, which is going to take care of the caching. So we're going to wrap and create a proxy, which first check if we have the URL parameter in our cache. If we have, we're going to return the response from the cache. And if we don't, we are going to make the actual request. It's pretty important here, guys, to understand that there's cache validation limitations that needs to be aware, but at the most basic example, this will do just fine. Let's take a look at a bit more advanced design pattern when it comes to testing. It's called attack proxy pattern. We have our testware making a request to our 
file server and requesting an object with an ID 1. We are going to perform this request, return the result, and in the next steps, we are going to create a randomized data and use it in our attack proxy to create multiple requests, sometimes called fuzz testing, which are going to attack the server and we're going to check for different error codes or how the actual server behaves. This is very useful in our practice because with a very little effort, we can create a lot of tests. Let's take a look at the data warehouse and how we can test it and different patterns that we can employ. Data warehouses are central repositories of integrated data from one or more sources. So they store current and historical data in one single place, which is then used for creating analytical reports for the business. It's considered a core component of any business intelligence. And first and first most we need to understand and foremost we need to understand that data warehouses are a data centric solution and we need a data centric testing to check if the data in a warehouse has integrity is reliable accurate and consistent within the organization, meaning that we should check for all the data quality attributes. We should cover not only the data, but the complete data pipeline. So we have, for example, different extract, transform and load operations. We have to validate data at all intermediate stages, meaning that we should also validate all the different operations that are happening during this extract, transform and load process. It's not just the data, it's the entire operation that we're going to look into. Data warehouse testing also covers the business intelligence reports and the dashboards to run <clears throat> that run using the consolidated data in the source, meaning that we should also consider how we're going to test the final reporting. Even our primary focus is on the data itself, we should also consider the different applications and the different integrations that this data warehouse is actually having. So different ATL tools, reporting engines, graphical user interfaces needs to be included in our testing framework. We are going to cover everything end to end. Let's take a look at a very popular and common pattern when it comes to data warehouses. It, it's called pipes and filters. So the basic idea here is to decompose a very complex tasks and to have this series of different separate elements to be reused, modular, and can be combined into different pipelines. This can improve our performance, scalability, and reusability by allowing us to perform processing to the deployed and scaled independently modules. Let's make this a bit more visual. So as we can see, we have data from two sources, which are going through a series of these different tasks, pipes, and is going to be processed at the end, transformed and fed into the business logic layer. Meaning that we should all test these different tasks. We need to test with different data and we need to be aware that at each stage, we need to check not only the data quality, but the functions that operate on this data. Let's take a look at the facade, facade design pattern. In most simple terms, this is an object that provides a simplified interface to a large system. In most cases, a very complex system that's composed by different and interconnected subsystems. So facade makes it easier to use and understand in more reliable way and reduce the dependencies on external or other code. So we're going to talk about dependency inversion principle and that it covers how our high level components should not depend on the lower level components. Both should depend on abstraction. Let's take a bit more visual example. Let's say we have client or clients who are going to invoke an order facade. All they need to see is really the order API or page or whatever interface we have here. It's responsibility of the order facade to really call a payment API, <clears throat> which in its turn can go and call an inner class 
or we can move and call different subsystems. All this is hidden from the clients and they're provided with a bit simplified interface that they can communicate and rely on. It's also important to understand that intention of this pattern is to hide a complex set of interdependent subsystems. Let's take a look at a Java example, which is going to be a data warehouse for SAID. Let's say that we want to generate a report based on its type and on its source when it's stored and kept. So the complicated stuff is going to be hidden and we can also, we can only go and invoke this data warehouse for SAID and provide just the database, the database type and the report type to the generate method invocation. So we can have here, for example, different database types like MySQL, we can have Oracle or any other database type. We, in it, this type, we can go and have different cases for HTML or PDF reports. So wherever, whenever this generate report is invoked and if we decide that we want the PDF report from MySQL database, we can just provide those two parameters and get the report without really caring about how the connection is going to be opened or maintained, how we're going to authorize or authenticate in front of this data store and how we're going to get all these reports reported back to us. The very next design pattern that we can go and make use here, it's called immutable shared fixture. It solves a very specific problem with erratic tests, those flaky tests that are actually passing one time or passing nine out of 10 times and we don't know why. So we can use a partial setup that's needed by the tests and have two logical parts in our shared fixture. The first part could be the stuff that every test needs and but never should be modified. In the second part, we can have objects that any tests need, but can modify based on their own needs. Let's take a look at a Java example. We're going to have a shared fixture flight management facade test. As we can see in the setup, we have a facade that needs to create a flight management implementation object. This is the part in which we don't modify and this is our immutable part. Later we're going to have an airport which is going to be the national airport with different flights and we're going to have different flights based on the test needs. So in the first setup part we have the shared fixture with both parts the immutable which is the flight management facade and the mutable national airport implementation. Moving to our actual test, we are going to cover the case in which we can cancel flights. So we can have and create a flight in this example from Tokyo to Osaka, and we can later try and invoke a cancellation over this flight. So we can go finally and assert that the canceled state is really what we're going to get when we call the mutable flight object. Multiton is another design pattern that is going to help us to manage and map a named instance of a key value pairs, having the responsibility of actually managing multiple but numbered instances of our objects. It ensures that a class has only limited number of those instances. A very quick example here could be a database connection pool, which we need to have with different threshold or we need to have it limited to a certain number of such database connections since those are very heavy to set up and very expensive to maintain objects. Multiton also simplifies the retrieval of such shared objects or we can use it in our test fixtures. Let's take a look in a C-sharp example. We're going to look today at SQL database example which stores different SQL database connections, again, via the multiton method, who is going to get an SQL instance, is going to check if we already have such an instance, and it's going to 
you retrieve us back to the first available one. Multitone, it's really a generalization of the singleton pattern. pattern. Creates a singleton object that's associated with a given key. And finally, it manages those multiple instances of the same singleton class. In conclusion, we need to understand how our technology stack works. We need to be aware of all the limitations, all the challenges that we need to solve in order to create and have a stable test solution for it. We need to acknowledge all the challenges and build the most fit for purpose solution when it comes to testing. And finally, we should use design patterns and concepts to allow evolution of scalable, maintainable and extendable testware. That's all for today. I'm Evgeny Kustodinov. You can contact me at GitHub, Gmail or LinkedIn. Thank you.